Welcome to Biology My Passion. I am Saumya Harikrishna. We are learning the chapter Sexual Reproduction in Flowering Plants. So we dealt up to pollen pistil interaction and double fertilization. Also we learn endosperm formation. Today we will discuss embryogenesis which is actually a part of post fertilization events. So once the zygote forms after fertilization, the zygote will stay for some time for the endosperm to develop because endosperm is providing nourishment to the developing embryo. So then the zygote will enlarge a bit and after that it will undergo a transverse division into two cells. The basal cell, though I am drawing it on the upper side, it is the basal cell. Okay, so uh, that is towards the micropylar end. That cell is called a suspensor cell. The small cell towards the terminal end is called a, the embryonal cell which is towards the chela cell end. Now, the upper cell or the basal cell undergoes continuous transverse division to form a series of cells. Actually, first it uh, divides into two, one large vesicular basal cell and the lower cell will undergo series of division to form almost seven to eight uh, suspensor cells. Whereas, this uh, embryonal cell undergoes longitudinal division and then followed by that uh, transversal division to form a globular shaped uh, embryo. So, the initial stage of embryo is called a pro-embryo. The pro-embryo develops into globular embryo. This suspensor is actually for pushing the embryo into the uh, endosperm which has developed in the seed because uh, the endosperm is the nourishment. Then what happens here? This uh, There is endosperm available for this globular embryo. Now the globular embryo undergo divisions and changes into a different shape called a heart shaped embryo. So the next stage is heart shaped embryo. Heart shaped embryo will now mature into the final mature embryo and here this is a dicot embryo so it has got two cotyledons. Uh, if you look at the parts of a mature embryo it has got two parts. The parts below the uh, level of cotyledons because cotyledons are attached to both the sides of the embryo. So below the cotyledon it will be called a hypocotyl whereas above the cotyledon level is called a epicotyl. So suppose these are the cotyledons the embryo below is called a hypocotyl above is called a epicotyl. So this is a transverse section you can see these two are some uh, the cotyledons. Now, uh, the hypocotyl will grow or terminate as a radical. The radical will grow into the root system. So, R for R you can remember radical to root. At the same time, this region is epicotyl. Epicotyl will grow into plumule. Plumule will grow into the shoot system. So, radical grows into the shoot and plumule into the root. When we come to the structure of a monocot embryo, monocot embryo has got only one cotyledon. That cotyledon is called a scutellum. So it's always asked what is the uh, cotyledon of monocot called? It is cutellum. And uh, there is endosperm. Endosperm is covered by a tissue called a alluron layer which is a proteinaceous layer. But you know the ploidy of endosperm is a triploid. So alluron layer is also triploid. Then coming to the embryo. Embryo has got again two parts. The radical and the plumule. But there is a uh, covering for this uh, tips. Radical is covered by coleorhiza and plumule is covered by coleoptile. Depending on the presence or absence of uh, endosperm in a seed, seed can be of two types, albuminous or a endosperma seed and exalbuminous or non-albuminous or non-endosperma seed. So what is the difference? If the endosperm is still remaining there, not completely utilized by the embryo, then it is called a, the albuminous seed or an endosperma seed. So endosperm is present in the seed not completely utilized by the embryo. Usually this is present in monocot seeds like a wheat, maize, rice etc. And castor is a dicot which is example for this. Whereas exalbuminous or non-endospermous or non-albuminous seeds means the embryo has completely consumed the reserve food material or the endosperm. So no more endosperm is available. Then where is the nourishment or the food present? It is there in the cotyledon. Food is stored in the cotyledon. Typical example of this category uh, is dicot plants. Pea, bean, groundnut. Any uh, pulses if you take, they are examples of this exalbuminous. But in monocot, the exception is uh, orchids, they have uh, exalbuminous seeds. 
uh, certain seeds have mucellus persistent in them. So the persistent mucellus in a seed is called a perisperm, which is deployed in nature. And uh, an example is beet and uh, black pepper. In certain plants, there exists a third integument called a uh, aril. It is uh, present in nutmeg and uh, lychee. The function of the aril is protection. In plants like pinus, more than one cotyledon may be found that is called a polycotyledony. Most fertilization events are happening after fertilization. So we learn the uh, development of a uh, endosperm and a uh, embryo. Meanwhile, the ovules harden and become the seed, whereas the ovary becomes the fruit. Now, usually what happens is the integuments, two integuments are there, outer and inner integuments, that will form the seed coat, outer testa and uh, inner tegmen. Then uh, it will undergo dehydration, leaving only 10 to 15 percent of moisture by mass. Rest all will evaporate, making it dry. So this will uh, push the seed into a dormancy period or inactive stage where metabolic processes come down or slows down and embryo enters into a dormancy state. So this is very crucial for keeping seeds for the future generation or we have to keep it in storage for our use. So what are the factors helping in that dehydration and the dormancy. Uh, now coming to the seed formation, uh, once the seed is formed, the micropyle will remain as a small hole on the seed coat which will help in absorbing oxygen and water during germination. So the seed will enter into dormancy and remain there till it gets the favorable conditions. So what are the favorable conditions for it to germinate? Adequate moisture should be available, oxygen and the optimum temperature. If all these factors are available, the seed will start growing or germinating into a new plant. Seeds also offer a lot of advantages to the uh, plants. You know that seed formation is dependent upon water. Seed has got a variable mechanism of dispersal. As a result, the species will spread to new geographical areas or uh, the competition can be avoided. Also, seed has got lot of reserve food material for the uh, plant or the seedling to get nourishment. Seed has got protective covering, so it protects the embryo well during the dormancy stage. It is a product of sexual reproduction, so it offers genetic variability to plants. So these are the advantages that the seeds offer. And the dormancy period of seeds vary from plant to plant. So some plants may have a dormancy period hundreds of years and some may have a few months. So from uh, Arctic Tundra, we got a Lupinus Articus plant uh, seed. That seed could germinate after 10,000 years of dormancy. So there is a species of date palm called a Phoenix Dactylifera. Recently we got the seed of that plant. The seed we excavated was 2,000 years old. Followed by fertilization, ovule develops into seed and ovary develops into fruit. Rest of the parts fall off. So ovary is the part becoming the fruit. So if ovary turns into a fruit, that fruit is called a true fruit. Sometimes the thalamus or the receptacle, the disc on which all the parts are kept, that also can develop into a fruit, then it is called a false fruit. So examples of false fruits are apple, strawberry, cashew. Remember, rest all are true fruits that we are studying. Then pericarp. The ovary wall is called the fruit wall. It is also called a pericarp. Carp means fruit, pericarp. So pericarp has again three layers, epicarp, mesocarp and endocarp. If you take the mango as a typical example, the outer skin is the epicarp. The fleshy part we are eating is the mesocarp. And the inner part, the hard covering is the uh, endocarp. Now coming to parthenocarpic fruits, sometimes the fruit may develop without fertilization also. Such fruits are called a parthenocarpic fruits. Since there are no fertilization happening, uh, the fruits are seedless fruits and they are little larger in size than the normal fruits. So commercially if you are thinking, parthenocarpic fruits are more uh, economical or more uh, in demand compared to the normal fruits or the seeded fruits. So we can induce parthenocarpy by spraying a hormone called a oxin. Let us learn two important concepts or terminologies in this chapter. Apomixis and a polyembryony, both are more or less related. Apo means away, mixis means mixing, away from mixing. So when is mixing happening? During fertilization or syngamy, the mixing happens or the fusion of gametes happen. As a result, seed will form. But here, the seed is forming without fertilization. Remember, we already learned fruit forming without fertilization is called a parthenocarpy or the fruits formed are called a parthenocarpic fruits. 
Here, seed forming without fertilization is apomixis and the seeds are called a apomictic seeds. So here actually, uh, since there is no fusion or the gametes, the gametes are not fusing, this is called a asexual reproduction. But seed is the result of sexual reproduction. So we can say that in apomixis, the asexual reproduction mimics sexual reproduction because there is seed forming which is actually the result of a sexual reproduction. So usually during fertilization, a haploid male gamete fuses with a haploid female gamete to form a diploid zygote which will develop into the diploid embryo. But in case of apomixis, what happens? There is no male gamete involved here. The female gamete is formed without reduction division or meiosis. As a result, it is diploid. The diploid female gamete directly develops into a diploid embryo. So here there is no syngamy or fertilization happening. So this is called a uh, apomixis, which is actually happening in two families called a asteraceae and a compositae. One more way this can happen that is through polyembryony. Poly means many, many embryos are formed. So here is the embryo sac, surrounding the embryo sac there is nucellus. Nucellar tissue are deployed. So here what happens is the nucellar tissues will multiply and they will protrude inside the embryo sac. And they are all deployed so they can also develop into embryo. In such case many embryos form that is called a polyembryony. So in polyembryony the nucellus is developing into the embryo and that is called a, an example of citrus and a mango. Now we have to discuss the significance of apomixis. What is the significance of apomixis or how can we make use of this uh, process in agricultural field? Usually for a farmer to get higher yield, they depend on high yielding variety of seeds or HYV seeds. You know, HYV seeds are produced by this plant breeding processes which are actually very tedious and a cumbersome procedure. As a result of that, the HYV seeds are quite expensive. So if a farmer is using uh, expensive seeds of HYV seeds for his first generation, once the uh, seeds here he is getting from that, he cannot use it for the next generation because here the mixing of characters might have happened and we cannot expect the same result. So the next generation again he has to purchase new set of HYV seeds. So this is a financial burden on the farmer. But how can we overcome this process by apomixis? If we are developing the HYV seeds once and later these seeds are apomictically developed, then there is no combination of characters. As a result, the same character we can ensure in the coming generations as well. So they can reduce the use of hybrid seeds in further generations. So this is the main advantage of apomixis. Hope you understood the lesson well. Thank you for watching my video. Please like, share and subscribe to my channel Biology My Passion.